Ta, PhD from Texas A&M, and he teaches all over the world in Latin America, the United States, even in my home country of Italy, in Trieste. It's, a, it's the second visit to uh, St. Patrick's, having been here this past spring for another event. So it's your turn, please. Thanks, Gabriel. Thank you very much for such a great introduction. It's my pleasure to be here. I would like to uh, give thanks to Angel Smith for inviting me. Uh, I came here um, to a live teen event and we had an informal conversation with Angela and she said, well, we had the Provita Institute and we would like you to come to visit and I'm here. I'm delighted to be here. This community is uh, very alive I enjoy being here, so thank you very much for the invitation and for your hospitality. Thanks. So uh, today we're going to talk about uh, genetic manipulation in human history from agriculture, GMOs, and beyond. Uh, next slide, please. Um, let me talk briefly about the history of agriculture and how this is uh, important and pertinent to this talk today. So first, rice was domesticated in China uh, between 1100, uh, 11,500 and uh, 6200 BC, before Christ, uh, followed by mung, soy, and some other beans. Now, this was probably one of the first records that we have for domestication in different parts of the world. We had that in 9500 BC, we have a number of crops that were domesticated um, in the Eastern Mediterranean, what is, uh, let's say, uh, Palestine, Israel, and, and that part of the world. Uh, we also have sugar cane and some root vegetables domesticated in New Guinea, yeah, about 7,000 BC. The potato and also tomato were domesticated in the Andes between 8,000 in 500 BC, along with beans, cocoa, uh, llamas, alpacas, guinea pigs. Uh, cotton was also domesticated in the Americas, uh, in Peru by uh, 3600 BC. And we also have wheat, barley, so a number of crops that have been domesticated uh, started very early in uh, human history. Now, we have that plants have been domesticated uh, for at least 10,000 years. Some people estimate that plant domestication have occurred as early as 15,000 years. And uh, this involved selecting specific traits, traits for uh, um, selection of fruits, flavor, um, and other characteristics of interest. These characteristics included high, higher yields, but also reduced toxicity, improved flavor, morphology, and also um, some characteristics that prevented them from getting certain diseases as well. Uh, next, please. This is a figure that shows different uh, centers of diversity in the world. So we have one in Mexico and Guatemala, uh, number one there. Number two, we have another one in Peru, Ecuador, and Bolivia. Uh, then in southern Chile, in southern Brazil, Mediterranean, and so on. And these centers of diversity were also uh, centers where people have started domestication of plants. Next. Now, here we have a figure that mm, shows different um, centers of origins for plants in the world. And this is maintained by CIET, which is located actually in Colombia. It's uh, an international center for uh, tropical agriculture. And this is important because most, well, everyone here lives from plants. So no matter if we are omnivores, carnivores, or vegetarians, we ultimately depend on this. Um, and we have um, a number of crops that, for example, are original from the Americas. Uh, now thinking about Italy, uh, the Italian cuisine didn't know about tomato 
until Christopher Columbus came to America. So it's really interesting to think about how could we have uh, Italian cuisine without Romania. But that's only true. <laughs> that's not the, uh, we think about chocolate, for example. Chocolate is, was also a product from the New World. We have um, uh, potato as well and um, corn. So um, there are a number of crops that we have uh, domesticated throughout history. Uh, next, please. Now, here we have two examples in America. So we have for plants in Mexico, Guatemala, that uh, part of South Mexican and Central American center. So we have a number of plants. We have uh, uh, peppers, papaya as well, guava, and, and tomato, and cacao as well. And in the South American center, the potato, which is uh, very important. And these plants are fundamental for food security and also uh, political stability in the world. Because no matter how much we fight for oil today, if we lack water or food, we will certainly go to war over that. Next, please. Now, this shows how corn was at the beginning, and we also have today this type of corns. This is the size of a uh, US quarter, 25 cents, and this is uh, the plant that was uh, originally before human selection. So this is for corn. As you can see, this is very similar to a grass that has different stalks. And we have selected throughout uh, human history for a plant that has not only a few kernels, but a bunch of kernels. And this began uh, between 6,000 and 10,000 years ago in uh, Mesoamerica, so that's uh, Central America. And that drastically changed this species of uh, mm, the wild corn, if you want to call it, into the modern corn that we have today. In fact, something interesting, for the ones who have visited Mexico, they have some of these wild plants that are cultivated today. And they're cultivated today because they want to have a delicacy called huitlacoche. And that's um, uh, a fungus that you can consume from corn. The corn that is eaten today, for example, here in the States or everywhere in the world, is not susceptible to Ustila gomadis, which is this um, fungus. But in Mexico, you can get some varieties that are susceptible to infection uh, for, to that fungus, and people consume that, that particular fungus. So if you like mushrooms, for example. OK, some people here may like mushrooms, OK? So mushrooms are. Uh, for the people that like them, uh, may have a certain appeal. Now, with la coche, which is uh, a, a fungus derived, well, that is cultivated in this corn, is absolutely delicious because it tastes is very buttery and has a lot of uh, protein content. So, there is still, of course, use for these wild varieties of corn. Next, please. Um, now, this introduction about uh, agriculture in human history, it's important because we have been modifying uh, genetically these crops. And not only um, these particular crops, but also domesticated animals in a way that favors um, us as humans. So um, let's talk about how actually genes work. And this is a very simple representation. We have the DNA. We have talked about DNA today. And thank you, Father, for such a great introduction. 
uh, we have uh, that another structure that harbors uh, the DNA is the chromosome. Uh, the chromosome is inside the cell and inside uh, cells form entire organisms. So what we have is a flow of information that starts here in the DNA and that finally produces what we see. So the organisms as we see. So could be a human, could be an animal, could be a plant. Next, please. So um, this is also another presentation for uh, how this flow of information happens. So we have the DNA that has the instructions, the material, the genetic material that has the codes for how uh, we're going to be um, designed. And this comes in a balance between not only our genetic makeup, but also our environment. We are the result of both. So uh, whomever tells you that we are destined to suffer from some illness or from some condition because of your genetic makeup uh, may be wrong. You need to consider the environment where you live as well. So we have the DNA, we have the genes, we have chromosomes, we have cells, but um, and those genes code from proteins, proteins make up cells, and then we have the organism. Next, please. So how are genes manipulated? So we have a number of techniques that we use today, and before, uh, we have to also remember the case of agriculture where we started to do genetic manipulation 10,000, 15,000 years ago by selecting those uh, characteristics that were important for us. Next, please. Um, we have, right now, tools that are more precise to select for those characteristics that we may be interested in. So, for example, let's say that um, we want to make a corn that is uh, that has a higher yield, and again, this is important because we need to uh, ensure food safety, not only for the United States or the developed world, but also for uh, countries that are um, less fortunate than us. And that will guarantee uh, security and stability uh, throughout the world. So this is a figure that shows uh, the DNA being uh, modified by being modified by an enzyme that uh, is acting upon the DNA. Next, please. Now, this figure is from 2015. There has been a report that came from the National Academy of Sciences on uh, how GE or genetically engineered crops are. Um, planted throughout the world. So we have now that 12% 12, uh, 12% of the world cropland. So that that is the land that we can farm uh, has um, modified or um, genetic engineered organisms. So um, this shows not only uh, how popular they have become in the US, we have a large number of uh, genetically modified crops. Also in the Americas, if you can see, for example, here in, uh, in Europe, you see that is, uh, there's not um, a widespread, and that's because of, uh, of society over there. I believe that um, to guarantee food security, we actually need to invest in these technologies and we need to develop them further. There has been a number of uh, people that may feel that uh, genetically engineered um, organisms, like for example uh, plants, uh, may be harmful. I personally think that uh, we should look uh, specifically at uh, food additives or food preservatives. 
I am more concerned about that than the safety of, uh, of genetically engineered uh, crops. So um, we started modifying, for example, uh, tomato. That was probably one of the first um, cases that we had. And tomato ripes very quickly. So this first tomato used to be called the flavor saver tomato. I don't know if you have remembered, maybe vaguely, probably in the 90s. So this tomato had uh, a mutation in an enzyme that will prevent uh, ripening or that will delay ripening. So the shelf life of that tomato will be longer. That was the only characteristic. So remember, we have been modifying genetically uh, crops since 15,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago for sure. So these are uh, some of the, the tools that we have developed today is basically a very precise way to change um, the genetic material in a way that we are selecting for some of those traits in a very specific way. Next, please. Now, these are yields of maize, cotton, soybean in the US from the 80s up to 2011. So we have maize here, cotton, and soybean. The vertical lines here mark the introduction of uh, genetically modified organisms. So as we can see, the trend uh, from before and after uh, the GMOs were introduced keeps going uh, up, right? So the, um, the yield is increasing because of a number of reasons. We have uh, learned to manage pests better. We have selected for better um, better traits that have uh, big, uh, better yields and we have been able to cultivate some areas that were not uh, cultivated before. Uh, now we have some challenges ahead of us because of climate change as well, but we need to uh, continue with these trends if we want to guarantee food security. And I cannot stress that enough because uh, it is critical that we keep uh, feeding the population as we grow. Next, please. Now, right now, uh, and this is from a report from the National Academy of Sciences that was released uh, in the spring, we propose a series of analysis on these genetically modified organisms to guarantee their safety. So they divide, they're divided in four tiers. The first one is where you find no differences between the current varieties and the new variety that has been modified genetically. In that case, if you find no differences using uh, omics analysis, that means analysis of the genome, of the transcriptome, of the metabolome, so characteristics that uh, define at the molecular level what that organism is. If you find no differences, uh, the panel uh, proposes no further testing for that. So let me detail what that is. So for example, let's say that we have an organism, a plant, right? Uh, for the sake of this example, and you analyze it chemically, okay? You, a plant typically has X amount of sugars, X amount of protein, X amount of, of fat, right? That is typical from that particular species, let's say soybeans or corn or whatever. So if you don't find any molecular differences between the new variety and the old variety, what they're proposing is let's not do more testing. Um, the second tier, if we understand the differences but no expected uh, health or envi environmental effects, they propose also no further testing. And only in cases where there are uh, differences with potential health or environmental effects 
or we have differences that cannot be interpreted, that's when uh, further testing is recommended. Now, I believe that also the general public deserves to know if something has been modified genetically or not. So there has been a number of efforts to uh, keep labels on what uh, is the food that you're eating. But I personally, as a scientist, uh, believe that we should be more worried about preservatives and, and food additives. Uh, let me tell you a, a small story. I was, so I'm originally from Colombia, and I came to the US, this was 97 for grad school. I was visiting a friend and uh, he said he um, trained in bacteriology, which is like a microbiology. And he said, look at this, I'm gonna show you something. I have a cheese in my fridge that I tried a year ago. I didn't like it and it's still there. Nothing happened to the cheese. So I said, are you serious? Yes. Then I went to the fridge to look at it myself. It was a processed cheese. So I said, okay, so I, I, I'm trained as a microbiologist. So I said, well, if a bacteria doesn't want to eat that cheese, or a fungus doesn't want to eat that cheese, what does that mean? It, it means only one thing. It means it is poison. Right? Okay, so bacteria doesn't choose what to eat. They will get there and they will try to eat it. And if they grow, they survive, right? That they're feeding of it. If they cannot eat it, it means it's poisoning them. The same thing with the, with, the, with the fungus. So here we have a piece of cheese processed that was probably approved by FDA at some point and it's in the, in the grocery store, right? And uh, it doesn't rot for a year. So I said, okay, if the bacteria doesn't want to eat that or the fungus doesn't want to eat that, maybe I shouldn't be eating that stuff, <laughs> right? So um, that's, uh, I, I invite you to take a look at your labels and see exactly what you have there, right? And um, if you can, for example, choose to let's say make your own bread or or make your own hummus or make your own things, you may be uh, better off because you know what you're ingesting. But in terms of genetically modified crops, is the way I see it is uh, a very precise way of changing a characteristic that is desirable for us. So uh, next, please. Um, we have, so there is this um, report, again, in this website, uh, nascites.org. So I'm gonna leave these slides with you guys, so if, if you want to refer to them, you can go. Um, this is, again, from the US National Academy of Sciences. And for the ones who don't know or not familiar with the National Academy of Sciences is um, a group of scientists of very high level. They have been selected, handpicked. You get to the National Academy of Sciences by election, right? You, it's not a paid membership. So very high profile scientists have uh, studied over 30 years or no, sorry. Uh, yeah, almost, this probably started in somewhere in the 80s. So at least 20 years, the benefits and the risk of genetically engineered crops. So um, this particular report has um, some layman terms, is in layman terms, they also have videos, but I invite you that if you're curious about uh, the safety of genetically engineered crops to take a look at this particular report in the National Academy of Sciences because it's very thorough uh, and it has been uh, examined by a panel of experts in the field. Next, please. 
Now, I'm gonna change a little bit and talk about current genome editing technologies. Um, so we have that GMOs, we basically started making transgenesis. So transgenesis is you have a single gene that you want to change or you want to introduce, let's say for example, in the case of um, corn that has been modified genetically, they usually have a toxin from a bacteria, Bacillus thuringiensis, that is very specific for um, pests that attack corn. So the Bt corn is basically uh, a corn that has that toxin that is, uh, it doesn't affect us, it only affects certain uh, insects that when they eat, then they get the toxic uh, effect. So we used to get the entire gene and put it into the plant uh, to, let's say, cause resistance to pests or cause resistance to, um, um, to some agents that may uh, affect, for example, uh, other pests or, or other uh, weeds to get rid of them. So uh, now we have technologies that can uh, precisely edit or change in a very fine way the genetic information. And those are technologies like uh, sync finger proteins or uh, transcription activator um, effectors or the CRISPR-Cas uh, technology that um, Father Dan talked today in the morning. Now, CRISPR-Cas has been um, more popular because it's easy to use, is relatively uh, cheap also, but of course it has um, a number of risks. Now, let me give you a little bit background. Where does this start? So CRISPR-Cas is actually an immune system for bacteria. So it's an adaptive system. So we have an immune system. And the way it works is you are exposed to these organisms that attack us. And that happens every day. Right now, as we speak, we have organisms that are trying to make us sick. So we're fighting a battle constantly. Our immune system is fighting a battle constantly uh, with organisms, foreign organisms trying to get us sick. And the same thing happens with bacteria in this system. Uh, basically, what it does is it takes small pieces of the DNA from uh, phages, which is a virus that infects bacteria, and puts them, those pieces, into the genome. So it can, the next time the virus comes in, it can recognize it and cleave it specifically, so cut, cut the DNA. So as the cell um, gets exposed to more organisms, that CRISPR locus keeps growing. So you, you're learning, you're adapting. So this is a natural system. And when it was described in bacteria, people got very excited. People said, oh, this is very cool because now we can use this particular system, which occurs in nature, to defend yourself from foreign attacks to modify genomes. Next, please. So the way it works is you have two molecules uh, of RNA. One that has the piece that gets recognized in the genome another one that guides it, an enzyme that actually does the cut. So you basically can say, okay, I'm gonna target a region of the genome that I wanna cut, and I provide a good copy, the copy that I want to modify with, and I transfect this whole system, so insert it into that particular cell, and fix it. Now, uh, 
Father Dan pointed something very important, and that is that this particular technology has uh, caveats, has drawbacks, like off-target um, events. And the way this happens is um, our genetic code has only four letters. Our alphabet has what, 29? 26, okay. So we have 26 letters, and with 26 letters, we, we can compose words and phrases, right? Those phrases are very precise. They're so precise that we can communicate very precisely with our language, and sometimes we don't even have to repeat what we mean. Only by saying some words, we can communicate very effectively and very precisely. So. In, in the DNA uh, language, since we only have four letters, we need longer words to have a very precise me meaning. And uh, right now with CRISPR-Cas, those letters that we can uh, form, they're not long enough. And you can have, for example, off-target cuts. So instead of cutting precisely the molecule that I want to cut, uh, I may cut elsewhere, right? Now, another thing that happens is the efficiency of the repair is not 100%, right? So even though there's a lot of hype and a lot of excitement and people are starting to do experiments in China or in other parts of the world, we need to be very cautious with this type of technology. So for example, we have genes in our genome that are not in single copy. There are multiple copies, right? So if we want to use this technology to edit those copies, how can we target that particular molecule with 100% efficiency to the location where, where we want to change? That is not possible today. So we have a number of um, caveats, uh, like multiple transcript isoforms or SNPs present also. SNPs are variations, normal variations. We have different colors of hair, we have different colors of skin, so that we have uh, right now in this room a number of variations that makes us different and unique. So uh, if you have a change that uh, because it's just the way you are, uh, you won't be able to target the same gene with the same efficiency in all the population. So that's also uh, another thing. Uh, well, the knockout refers to erasing a gene. If you try to fix something, but you break it instead, right? Oops, exactly. That may lead to lethality. Uh, well, and, and so on. Next, please. So, on the human gene editing, there is this document that also Father Dan also pointed out, uh, which is um, a document that came out after a meeting, and uh, we have some uh, guidelines. So, for basic and preclinical research, that means this does not involve individuals. This may involve, for example, cell lines or in vitro systems. Uh, given the potential benefits, and this is taken directly from the, the report, uh, given the potential benefits from this technology's basic and preclinical research should proceed subject to legal and ethical rules and oversight. This may include early human embryos or germline cells, but which should not be used to establish a pregnancy. Now, this uh, is a recommendation from the, from the National Academies. However, uh, next one, please. The clinical use, so this is for therapeutic uh, purposes. Um, Gene editing in somatic cells, for example, gene editing red blood cells to trick sickle cell anemia, such clinical cases affect only the individual who receives them, 
and so can proceed under existing regulatory frameworks and should be allowed to continue. When gametes or embryos are altered by gene editing, much uncertainty surrounds safety, efficacy, and societal issues. So uh, Father Dan also pointed out that um, the difference between somatic and, and germ. So uh, somatic is everything that is not gametes. So pretty much everything. So whatever is not eggs or sperm, is somatic. Next one, please. So for germline, and this, this is also uh, interesting. When gametes or embryos are altered by gene editing, much uncertainty surrounds safety, efficacy, and societal issues. As a result, the third statement, so that means clinical use of germline, deems irresponsible to proceed for now. Uh, but the issue should be revisited regularly as scientific knowledge advances and societal views evolve. So right now is deemed irresponsible to do this type of research, which is uh, basically a response to the um, to the Chinese study uh, that was published uh, um, recently. So. Um, Finally, the summit agreed that although each national authority ultimately regulates activities under its jurisdiction, there is a need for ongoing discussions held uh, by an international forum that brings in a wide range of nations, expertise, including general public, regulators, industry, and also faith leaders. So um, I don't know how, and, and I'll be interested to know further than why uh, relationship do you guys have with the National Academy of Sciences? Nothing. Okay, so it, they are definitely open because this is in, in, in statements. So I believe that this would be also a good time to get involved into, into this type of discussions. Now, um, I am a Catholic and I'm a scientist and I believe, same as you, that this experimentation in, in embryos should be off limits because then we're, we're playing God and we should, that's not our, our, our place. Um, and I'm really glad that uh, the church is in the same page in terms of uh, therapeutical treatments, right? that only uh, affect the individual and that the outcome will in improve the life quality of that particular individual. Uh, but uh, I think this is a good time, a good moment to uh, get probably, uh, or at least um, investigate possibilities of joining this type of, of um, uh, meetings where high-level people can write documents and make docu uh, recommendations about uh, how we should proceed on this. Uh, next one. And uh, thanks for your attention. Again, I would like to thank both Angela and Gabriel for their hospitality, and I would like to take questions right now. Can I follow up this? Yes, absolutely. There are, there are two groups. Uh, there are two groups that are involved with this discussion. One is at the national level, and that is the United States Catholic Conference of Bishops. And it interacts with issues like the uh, local federal regulation of, of uh, Food and Drug Administration, Health and Human Services Administration, and other agencies and organizations within the national level. On the international level, we have the Pontifical Academy for Life. Now, the Pontifical Academy for Life, housed in Rome, is um, uh, an advisory council to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. There are Americans that serve on the PAL, the Pontifical Academy for Life, um, 
and those those would include Dr. Haas from the National Catholic Bioethics Center and uh, Richard Dorflinger, who was formerly the assistant director of the Secretary for Pro-Life Activities Committee on, with which I work. Uh, those people then do engage the international community's discussion, and so there is co communication at the level of the broader scientific community, which has an uh, internationally vested interest in but there is no regulatory agency other than the local regulatory agency. All of the international agencies make recommendations to local regulatory agencies at the national level. Okay, and so that, for example, whether we could control what's going on in the Chinese experimentations with embryonic, uh, it's, it's not going, it's, it, nothing we do at the level of the American, uh, we, we, could, we could try trade and other kinds of influence, but we can't regulate their own activities. Same thing is true with um, the Scandinavian experiments that we saw earlier with regard to gender issues. So we, we have think globally, act locally. The think globally is the Pontifical Academy for Life. The act locally is the national conference with regard to federal legislation. State legislation and state allocation of funding has to be fought by state Catholic conferences of bishops and then on the way down. Thank you, Father. Okay. You were talking about uh, GMO foods, and right, right now um, there's a strong um, push with food makers, Hershey Foods in particular. They're trying to get legislation passed not to put non-GMO on their labels. And see, nobody really knows what causes cancer. I mean, uh, and I understand you as a scientist said that uh, it's the preservatives, and the additives that we have to worry about, which I, okay. All right, but see, uh, as, as someone suffering from cancer, we need to, I mean, we, the public needs to know that you can't push, you can't allow food um, makers to not put that on there, like to hide that from us and let us make those decisions. So, I mean, I did see that, um, you know, maybe it is the, you're the scientist and you know much more than I do, so it's very possible that it is the additives and the preservatives, especially for that one-year-old cheese. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's, pro it's probably older than that. Yes, that, that's a very good point, and I agree. So for example, when there is an advocacy group for, I think, food and water, and um, they are pushing to label foods in terms of what they are. I believe, uh, and I agree with you, that we should have as much information about what we're eating as possible. And if you don't want to eat this type of food because, uh, let's say, um, it's from Canada or from Mexico or it has GMO or, right, you have the right to know. Um, so I urge you to, um, Subscribe, for example, to these advocacy groups. Uh, one, I, I think, is food, water, and, and something else that uh, gets you news about who votes for this and who votes for that. But there is right now legislation that is um, um, that people are are trying to get more labels instead of removing information from those labels so people can be informed about that. Um, now, another thing that I really think that we can also do as a community is uh, the U.S. has um, developed uh, the food industry in a, a very global way. We consume, for example, products from you know pretty much all over the world, and we have lost the values that we have of um, consuming local, locally sourced foods. So for example, that's very important in Europe. It's very important in South America. It's very important also in Asia. Uh, the, there are a lot of markets where you can go and there's a, a market where you can get you know, produce and, and local meats and local things. So I believe that we should try to promote also uh, that uh, feeling because it's good for the community, right? You're supporting 
some local butcher or some local farmer that may be your friend, right? As opposed to buying produce from all over the world, God knows with what many preservatives, right? So I believe that we should, as communities, strengthen those local efforts to get um, uh, local food. But uh, in terms of what can we do to get more labels, that is done at the legislative uh, part. So urge your, your um, local leaders, your senators, your um, yeah, congressmen to try to pass on those laws. What has happened to the cloning? Uh, is there such thing going on yet? Uh, yes. Um, cloning, I haven't heard a lot after Dolly, which was the, the sheep that was cloned in the UK, and then they cloned it and she died. Uh, I have heard some efforts to clone pets, uh, but I believe that people are not doing that uh, anymore, or at least uh, funding or general interest has not uh, pursued uh, that way. Um, a lot, we have heard about uh, advances in terms of stem cell research. So right now, for example, there's a big push to uh, drift away from embryon, embryonic stem cell research towards uh, adult cell stem research. So um, I think that the community and, and the society has been vocal enough to try to ban all those efforts that involve embryos. Uh, I believe that we still need to do a lot more in that field, but um, in science, people tend to do experiments on the easiest models. So for example, if you have an easy or cheap experiment, people will try to do that as opposed to something that is gonna be more convoluted and more uh, expensive, just because that, that's the way it works. But um, we in the community need to be aware of what is happening, that's why it's important that we meet and we talk about these issues uh, so we can also get in contact with our leaders in the community and tell them how we feel about this new and emerging issues. Kevin. Yes. I don't know that it's a question as much as it's just a statement that might generate a little discussion. One of the slides that you showed for the NAS statement made a comment about, it was probably two or three back, made a comment about, no, it's, it's not that one. There we go, no, one more, I think. Yes, societal views evolve. Right. So, to me that's a real red flag, yes. because yeah. you can have something that's morally repugnant. Right. That, he, you know, there'll be kind of a working on people's emotions in order to bring them around emotionally to, to a different point of view, but not necessarily based on good science or good ethical principles. So, you know, like even the, this whole discussion of GMO foods, which, to be honest, I know very little, um, you know, is the concern based on good science, let's say. <coughs> Meanwhile, in England, you can take genetic material from a third person and, in, and inject it into a, a, a baby, and that's, by law in England, that's okay. And there didn't seem to be much of a, an outcry, let's say, that you would, you know, you know what I'm saying? So like, yeah. it, I just think it's really hard at this time in our history, because there is so much emotion, instead of there being a rational discussion, whether it's, you know, faith or whatever. I, I don't know, I'm just, I wonder, I mean, to me that's like, oh, there's the little loophole that everyone's going to jump through eventually, is this societal evolving. Right. Yes, that, that's actually a, a very good point. Um, I believe that we need to be first aware of what is happening. And... Um, 
in science, sometimes what, what I have seen is science will get done no matter where it is. So for example, uh, the case of GMOs. Um, Europe has been very resistant against introduction of GMOs. And that's why when you see Europe, is basically blank. Uh, whereas here in the US, we've had 20 years of experience in terms of, of GMOs. So if Europe says, OK, we're not going to do research in this area, it will get done in the US, or it will get done in China, or, or wherever, right? So we need to get groups from leaders from different countries. And these statements were actually uh, gathered not only from people from the US and Europe, but also there is a, a Chinese uh, leader, um, a scientist uh, leader that participated in this particular statement. They got them involved. So these are efforts where there is a discussion about what is going on. And that, that was probably prompted by that paper that Father Dan uh, mentioned about the modification of human embryos in, uh, in China. So uh, we need to be vigilant. We need to also educate our own children because uh, we may have our own views right now. But we have the opportunity to talk to the new generations, the, the children, the, the adolescents, about this type of issues and what are views in terms of moral, what should be done, what, what, it, what should be off limits, and what are the things that uh, should be, uh, that, that technology can be used for uh, health improvement as opposed to the enhancement or, or creating uh, things that, that we shouldn't be actually playing with. Um, what is going to happen? Uh, we are now very close to personalized medicine. So for example, we have discovered a number of changes in our genome that um, are very important in terms of how we take some drugs, how fast we can metabolize them, uh, are they effective with our genetic makeup, or are they less effective? So in the future, I see that uh, we will receive treat treatments, medical treatments that are going to be more effective. Uh, hopefully, for example, I, I hope to see, let's say, um, we, we are made to last about 55 years, 60, made as a machine, OK? So we wear off, right? So I would love to see something like um, replacement of cartilage using stem cell therapy, where you could, let's say, grow cartilage and you know repair all those things. Uh, be, because instead of, exactly, instead of replacing that with uh, titanium or, or, right? So hopefully we, we should see this in, in the, the next 30 years. Hopefully, I, I hope for that. With cells derived from our own body, right? Not from third party. Uh, or, or some other DNA or some other origin from other people, but from our own. Um, so we are likely to see all those medical advances. Also, we have challenges, big challenges right now are cancer and mental diseases. Uh, um, heart disease is also important, but it's not as important as it, it was uh, 30 years ago. Um, and uh, as we continue to learn more about what are these changes in the genome that uh, may lead us to disease or make us prone to, to some diseases, we will be able to uh, develop 
better therapies to uh, overcome those limitations. Yes. You're next. Hi, thank you. Um, so I guess I have a multifaceted question. Uh, maybe it's several questions. Um, when I was in college, um, I did a ethics paper on the Green Revolution. I was really excited about, um, about that as a way of providing food in developing countries. Right. Then what happened was that these um, crops replaced native crops. They were incredibly um, dependent on um, oil-based fertilizers, made it incredibly expensive for these third world farmers, put them into horrendous debt, and they were um, weak in terms of some things, unforeseeable mm. um, things. So huge unintended um, consequences. Right. Um, in the United States, um, I moved here from the Midwest, and um, the farmers were forced to buy corn that um, was sterile. So it didn't reproduce, and then you're putting farmers more and more and more into debt, and again, oil-based um, uh, fertilizers, which is not good for, uh, for the soils, and puts us, um, could make it risky for us as a, as a nation already hugely um, fossil oil dependent. Now, locally, I'm a beekeeper, and um, am really concerned about the health of my bees that as we go with more and more sterile or modified or um, all the, you know uh, pesticide based um, kind of plants that, that are, are both our honeybees and our native pollinators are incredibly at risk. And if they're not doing their job, oh, yeah. Yeah, then that's, everything that's tough, yeah. everything um, crashes. So I'm everything started off with really, really, really good intentions. Mm -hmm. But when we're dealing with things that are huge, not individual um, fixing something in myself, yeah. but something that is as huge as as crops, um, that I just wonder, you know, one mistake has tremendous consequences that we don't see now. Oh, it's really, really good now. 20 years down the line, whew, no, not, not. Right, that's a, a, a very good question. Um, so something like that happened with banana. So uh, we used to have um, a cultivar that was called um, Grand Name, which was developed in France by the Serrat. And Serrat is a research institute that uh, does research in crops in the colonies, right? So it'll be Africa and all that part. They developed this um, uh, grant name, which it, it means the big dwarf. And that happened to be highly susceptible to, to a disease and a lot of crops were lost, and it had to be replaced with the current banana, which is Cavendish today. So uh, there has been a number of learning lessons. Uh, for example, in, in Colombia, uh, people have fought Monsanto because they want to be able to cross the the local varieties with the the Monsanto variety, but then is is uh, sterile. So what can you do? Um, and uh, this has been, uh, I would say, there have been a number of efforts to first generate local varieties that are modified genetically. So cater to specific markets. Uh, instead of just developing a variety in the Midwest and trying to transport it all over the world and, and make it work, because that doesn't work. Uh, now, uh, 
they have used, for example, these techniques to make them sterile, so you keep being dependent on their seeds. I think that's evil, uh, but that's probably derived from the corporate greed. Uh, so as a society, I think we can also uh, try to make big companies like Monsanto more sensible about their, their real mission. I mean, they're interested in looking at having uh, food security, which is important. I mean, it's, for me, it's critical for world peace. If you don't have world uh, food security, then conflict is gonna follow. And, uh, and right now with climate change, that is, is happening very fast. For example, we don't feel climate change here as much, but if you go to the tropics, you feel it right away. Uh, for example, snow caps are disappearing, uh, and you see that the whole year round, whereas here we have the seasons to make us forget what happened last winter, right? We keep historical records and we keep a lot of things, but uh, land also rests here. In the tropics, you just keep producing, producing uh, at infinitum. So. Um, the tropical regions are particularly susceptible, extremely susceptible to this uh, change in, in climate. And so we need to develop technologies and, and crops and alternatives to keep uh, the world fed. Otherwise, we, we, we go into a, a very delicate state. Um, so, there has been things that we have learned over the last 20 years uh, in terms of how to introduce these desirable traits in local varieties and uh, yield has increased. Uh, I hope uh, that cost for the, I, I don't have that particular data, but it's interesting that you mentioned, so cost has probably increased for the producers as well. That's, yeah. Well, thank you. Um, well, um, <clears throat> excuse me. One of the issues, uh, if I can correct, with the genetic engineering in the embryo case is the fact that you, of that individual that will develop, you're actually affecting all the cells in that body. Yeah. Because the brain cell, uh, genetically, the brain cell is the same as the heart cell, is the same as the eye cell. And, you know, it, what happens is that those genes get blocked in the brain, the, the heart genes get blocked in the brain, and likewise vice versa. Now, if, you're, if you insert a gene that, as, uh, this morning, as far as cystic fibrosis, you don't know for sure that that's going to be blocked like it's supposed to be in the brain, heart, or anywhere else. And then, so therefore it might, I would think the thought is that it could possibly affect any other organ uh, in the body. And that's why it's really, got, you really have to be careful. And you may not see that for like, like you said, 10 to 20 years. Yes, definitely. I mean, we not only have the genome, but we also have uh, the epigenome, which are marks that are on top of the DNA. And they have, uh, they have, uh, they're important. Uh, certain marks have been associated with, uh, well, I don't know how speculative that is with behavior, you know, aggressive behavior and, and some kind of behaviors. So the epigenome is, is something that we have not really considered with this type of technology. So that's why uh, doing experimentation on the germ line, I believe, is, is very dangerous. The reason why is because, as you pointed out, we have no idea what this can uh, do. Now, from a scientist's point of view, we have that evolution is uh, a force that acts um, in, in the long term. 
right? So we, as, as humans, cannot pretend to be better and say, oh, this is the characteristic that I want, this, 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 and that will generate uh, a, a good offspring. And one example is we have done a lot of experimentation with plants. And we have made huge mistakes with plants too. Which is, you know, so we can, you know, if we forget what we have done with plants and we say, okay, that's plants, now we're gonna play with humans and we, we will certainly make those mistakes all over again, but the, the magnitude of, of the consequences will be uh, humongous, I mean, unthinkable to me. So we definitely need to uh, be extremely cautious with how we apply this type of technologies because it's not 100% effective. Uh, they're off targets, you know, uh, so it's not as, as precise as, as some of the things that we can actually do with plants. And we have made mistakes with plants. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Leonardo, it's a pleasure. Thank you for your presentation. Um, Combination to a very successful day. But let's thank the audience for the very informed, very searching questions from all of the speakers today. So let's just pause. Thank you. Okay, this is the end of a great day. Thank you for coming. You'll be hearing more from us. Kathy, did you want to? Why not? Um, it, it seems that we could almost sum this up as to claim God in a lot of what we are doing. And so where does that line reach each of us? Yes, yes, as we should improve maybe with the gifts God has given us, but this has had everything that we've talked about has had extreme consequences. So where do we stay comfortable and move forward as individuals instead of just feeling the, let's go, what's going on here? Well, I would, I would uh, respond, uh, you sort of have your choice. You can sort of say, welcome to Jurassic Park, <laughs> in which case you're in a, a world where you can play God and have a pain and suffering. Say welcome to the uh, incredible trust God puts in us as His <coughs> tools. Because the takeaway for today, I think, is I think it should send us to uh, the chapel to make us aware that the gift that God trusts us in life is a huge for our own lives and for the lives of those around us. And it sends, it sends me to reread the beginning of Evangelio Vita, the Gospel of Life, which begins as the scripture does, the Cain and Abel, and the question of who is my brother, and uh, am I his keeper? So it sends me to the Evangelio Vita, which is the most powerful pro-life document ever written, short of the, the half sheet. It's not the gospel. Um, <laughs> but it also sends, sends me to say that if I want to understand that I'm a steward of creation, it sends me to read La Bata Tu, the papal statement on stewardship of creation. And it then sends me to Amoris Laetitia, which talks about the family as the steward, original steward of life, and uh, the, the, the instrument by which God intended that the gift of procreation 
we draw our closest to our Creator even as we are engaged in the procreative act. So a, a day like today, I think, sends us not only with the answers, but with the direction. And I think that those three documents might be the documents that I think we're directed to by the conversation. Uh, the pro life of Michael's talk, I think, was sent to the Evangelium Vita to refresh uh, what the church has entrusted to us in the gospel of life. The responsibilities of family, gender, and identity, I think the church sends us to a more eschatesis, the joy of love. Uh, the most recent lengthy documents are proclaimed. And there are questions of genetic uh, documents that are really explaining us and Franciscan documents only that the prayer. Yeah. 
spiritual and corporal works of mercy as the as the as the as the strategy. If he says you'll have the greatest effect, the wrath that will sustain people into our midst because they will find in us mercy. That was actually a theory and a theology that St. Luke fashioned in the Holy Story, the great stories of mercy or the gospel of Luke. Um, is it with the gospel of joy? Is it is it the kind of uh, rejoicing over the gift that we have? Uh, perhaps. Or maybe I think the strategy, the weapons are unusual. The weapons, uh, we want a salvo of joy. And we want a salvo of corporal works of mercy. A, a bombardment of the spiritual works of mercy. But perhaps I think that that, that analogy may be the strategy that the current Holy Father has been <coughs> offering us in, in, uh, in, in these most recent I struggle to understand it, see how do I implement that, but I think that that seems to be the direction that the Spirit is giving us to translate Father. So perhaps that's what we ought to look for ourselves. Can I, can I just add one last thing before we close? It's a very practical speaking. Can I see a show of hands of the people in the room who are under the age of 30? Under the age of 30? <laughs> so proud to see you guys here and to spend this whole day I mean this is heavy duty stuff and for you guys to give your whole day today and the middle of the right. summer to be here you are the future Amen. And, to, and to be listening to this and to take it all in and do something about it that's what's going to make the difference in your life. Thank you for my call. That's true. <laughs>